Praise be to God. It's, it's good to be here again. We were away too long. Uh, two and a half months is too long. But it's great to be back. Praise be to God. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a title <laughs> for the message this morning. It's, it's from Malachi. Uh, maybe a little bit different from what normally is done, but it's called Heart Matters, The Heart Matters. You got that? Heart Matters, The Heart Matters. And I just want to start off by saying a couple of things about Malachi. Malachi is a, a really a unique book in the Old Testament and in the whole of the Bible. And for those who like it complicated, pre-Hegelian dialectics has a lot to learn or was, was used, has as its source this book. Dialectics is just simply a, a way, and the Marxists used it a lot, a way of question and answer so that you come to the truth. And we got questions here and answers. There are five, or actually six, disputations, which I don't know why the theologians have such long words. They're points of dispute between God and his people. His people have been called back to the land, the promised land, but now are, are apathetic, are just not really interested. Their heart is not in the matter. And this book, praise be to God, this book starts off in a special way. It starts off with, I have always loved you. Wow. There is no other book in the Bible that starts off in such a way. There's no other book in the Bible where God speaks so much in the first person. He's telling, it's, there's no other book. It's just unique in the whole Bible. And with that, because we've got so many good linguists here, uh, with that, that I have loved you, that tense used to be called a perfect tense when I was at school. And it's a tense which signifies something that began in the past and is still going on in the, in the present time. So Eve's has given me the, the nod there, so I'm okay with it. So it's, it's a tense. God is, is saying, I have loved you. I've, been, I've loved you from eternity to this point, and I, there's no reason, he's not giving any reason at all why he should stop loving. He's going to continue loving. Okay, so and where we get to, I think we're in chapter 3. I've tried to keep up with uh, the preaching on Malachi. With chapter 3, verse 6, it says... For I, the Lord, do not change. I mean, it starts off, for I have always loved you. And there are a couple of points of dispute. And now in chapter 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. He's saying to you now, to me now, I have loved you. As, as he did these people to whom Malachi spoke and wrote 2,400 years ago. But what does he want? What does God want? And when you read Malachi through, the, the main message of Malachi, he wants his people's heart. He wants his people's heart. All the points of dispute really come down to a heart attitude towards God. He doesn't want begrudging offerings. He doesn't want unfaithfulness, either in the family or in religion. He doesn't want his people to complain that he is blessing the wicked. The other people are getting blessed more than me. He doesn't. What, what does he want? He wants your heart. Amen? Could you just please look at the person next to you and say to him or her, God wants your heart. And, and, and a sneak preview of the very last verse <coughs> of Malachi, and the very last verse of the Old Testament, he talks about turning the hearts of the fathers to the children 
and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And if you read the Old Testament attentively, you will see that God is very interested in people's hearts. He, I, I came across it in, I've been reading 1 Samuel. It comes 1 Samuel 15, 1 Samuel 20. S Samuel is talking about the heart that God wants his people to serve him with all their heart. And you change your heart, you change your life. Your life is, con is, is conducted by your heart. The Bible says clearly in Proverbs 4, 23, keep your heart, in the, I, I know the old King James Version, keep your heart above all things, above all things, for, for out of it are the issues of life. The ESV that I normally read says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. So the Bible really is interested, God is really interested in our hearts. And it's worth reflecting upon this Jesus, our Savior, who came to this earth and he lived amongst us. He healed us, he delivered us. And when we permitted him, he transformed our hearts and really, uh, that's the past tense, I should say, in the present tense. It was his goal from the beginning, in fact, Jesus is amongst us now. He lives amongst us. He heals us. He transforms us. He transforms our hearts at this present time. He wants your heart. And he is not the God I was. He is not the great I was. I was with you every day. I I was the bread. No, I am the bread of life. I am. He is the great I am. He is the God of the present time. And he is working in our hearts now. Praise be to God. He still wants your heart. Could you just, just to remind the person next to you about what, what it's all about, could you... Could you please look at them again and say, he still wants your heart. <laughs> now, we, for, we tend to forget all this. Right? One part of the body emphasizes the word, Paul's teachings. Another part of the body emphasizes doing good. The another part emphasizes the working of the Holy Spirit. And it's all nice and necessary. But if you read Paul carefully, you will see he speaks a lot, lot about the heart. But what does the Bible actually say about the state of the human heart? Anybody know Jeremiah 17, 9, off by heart? Uh, for... For the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. I mean, honestly, think about it, brothers and sisters, not just a little bit. Sometimes it says deceitful and wicked above all things. It's deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Can you just please look at the person next to you and say, wow! <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah! Wow, it's, I mean, think about it. That's my heart, that's your heart. And we try to veil the heart with religions and good deeds in many shapes and forms, but God knows exactly where we stand. And he, Paul compares it to a veil. It's in, I mean, if you can get it together to put it on the screen, it'd be great. I prefer the ESV if you've got it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15. Can you get that together? Very good. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. And now 16. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, what's he... He's Paul is talking about the Jews at this time, the Judaism at this time. He's saying that 
because they don't believe in Jesus Christ and only are relying on the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, there's a veil over their heart. But when, when, oh, it's disappeared. When they turn to the Lord, when they turn to the Lord, no, no, 16. The one before that. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, Paul's not just talking about Judaism. He's talking about Anglicanism, Evangelicals, Pentecostals, Methodists. He's talking about everyone. He's talking to us all. We need to have our hearts uncovered before God because not about rituals or knowledge of the word of God, but it's about the change that takes place in the heart. The change that takes place in the heart. If I were to mention hardened hearts, uh, you probably, like me, would think of, of Pharaoh or Pontius Pilate or Herod or Herod's. But then I read Mark chapter 6, verse 52. For they did not understand, but their hearts were hardened. You got that one? I left out for the loaves. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the disciples. The disciples who just had another proof of the divinity of God. The disciples who just witnessed how he'd fed 5,000 people out there in a desert. Uh, I could talk probably for about two hours about that one miracle because it's such an important miracle. It's the good shepherd. Demonstrating his ability in that time, this good shepherd who's looking after each and every one of us, he brought his sheep together, he put them, he fed them, he blessed them. And then he walking on water, he's walking across the sea on water. And the Bible clearly says they didn't believe, they, they, they couldn't believe it because their hearts were hardened. I thought, Wow, if those guys had hardened hearts, where is mine? Where is my heart? I'm definitely not better than the disciples, and I can learn from them. And that fear of God came upon me. I thought, Lord, have mercy upon my soul that I may never, ever have a hardened heart before you. Praise be to God. And Paul goes on in, it's actually 2 Corinthians chapter 5 now, and verse, the second part of the verse, chapter 5, verse 12, so that you may, yes, the second part, well, let's do it for, from the beginning. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us. So this is the important part. So that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Wow. I mean, we, most of us get... I mean, I, I do make an effort on Sunday. I do shave and I put jacket on and stuff like that. I, I mean, I always think I was born in blue jeans, so they stay on, but... But I do make it a little bit of an effort on Sunday. You know, I try to dress up a bit better. Uh, but basically, basically, he's they're, they're saying there are people in the church, there are people in the body of Christ who have more or, or consider it more important how they look on the outside rather than what is in the inside, in the heart. I thought of a little story, in fact. I mean, I don't know if it really works, and I've never told it before. Imagine a, imagine a guy, uh, well, quite a well-off man, who, who decides to run a food bank. And he, he lets it known, he lets it be known in the community. He wants to do this, he wants to... He lets it be known that he's, a, he's sort of a do-gooder. He wants to do good for the community, but... But in reality, what he wants 
is to get the first pick of the free food because he's really stingy and he wants the food for himself. He wants to get the first pick for himself so he can cut down on his food bill. And then one day, one day, a woman comes to the food bank, four kids, her husband's just been killed on a building site and they just bought another car and a lot of debt so that he could drive to the site. He'd just been killed. They had no, no insurance. They had no nothing. The kids are hungry. She can't pay the rent. She has debts. She comes to the food bank. And on that day, the, the, the manager, the, the guy who runs the food bank, he gets, a, he gets some shipment of, of venison. Anybody? Venison is deer meat. I love venison, man. It's really nice meat. <laughs> So he gets a shipment of venison. And the woman, just as it comes in, it's a shop's closing down, so they clear it all out. It's not even out of date. It's, he, as, he, as he comes in, the woman comes in at the same time. This woman who's just lost her husband, her kids are hungry. They're literally hungry. And he looks at the woman and says, ah, oh, she won't appreciate venison. She won't appreciate venison. They've got practically nothing else on that day. And his heart, his heart betrays him. He keeps the venison for himself and lets the woman go hungry. And Malachi, if you look at all the disputations, a lot of them are this type of thing. You, you're just living for yourself. Your heart is not in it. Your heart is not with your God. Praise be to God. And the guy still managed to the, the, the manager of the, uh, the food bank still managed to look good in the community. He still managed to persuade people that he was doing others a favor by what he worked at. The heart is so important in, uh, in the parable of the soils, the earth and the seed. Remember the four things, they... The one was sown by the side of the road and was stolen. The other one was sown on shallow ground and came up, but then quickly wilted. The other one was sown in good ground, but then the weeds came up. And then the last one, you, you know this, the last one was sown in good ground and brought forth fruit. But what is the ground? Matthew doesn't tell us. Luke says twice, it's the heart. It's the heart. So it's not just for when we came to faith. It's for every word of God that may our hearts be open to receive his word deep in us and let that word transform us into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. At the time of Malachi, or as in the time of Malachi, when I look at my post-war generation, in 1968, which was the height of the hippie power, free sex and all that, I was 18. I was gone with all that stuff. Gone. Really gone. But I've noticed that in my generation, this post-war, the baby boomers, we, be we become, <laughs> or every generation following on has become more apathetic, more antipathetic. In other words, they don't care less about God and they're more against God than before. It just seems to be a downward spiral. Where is the heart of this generation? And we've, we've been praying lots, lots, Ava and I, especially for, with the churches we work with in Germany, for the youth it seems like the heart of that generation has been lost. Lord, touch their hearts. Bring them back. Don't let them drift off into oblivion. Bring them back to, to the fold, to your flock, Lord. And when I, oftentimes I listen to the news and, and listen, and I think this societal problem I mean, it's another case of, of Muslims, Afghanis, and Pakistanis grooming kids in, in Rochdale again. And 
I was thinking this type of problem can never really be, s be solved unless there's a change of heart. A change of heart amongst the Muslims, but a change of heart amongst the English as well. I mean, I can't see that, that it, it needs both sides. It's not going to, you can, you can throw money at it, you can do what you want, but unless there's a change of heart, nothing like that is going to be really solved on an ongoing basis. Hallelujah. There's another verse that I'd like to read be before. For with the heart one believes and is justified. This is Romans 10.10. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. I remember I, I was born again in a community in, in southern Spain. We, we still meet occasionally, uh, German speakers or French speakers or whatever speakers. And I remember, <laughs> I remember at a long table outside, and most of the people who came to the community were just plain hungry and had nowhere to sleep. So... This, I remember this one guy came in, uh, he was French, not that it makes any difference, but he was obviously homosexual. And we had boys' houses and, and girls' houses. I mean, it was just normal life. And he said, uh, he wanted to come into the community. And I, I said, well, I'm sorry, but not everybody can come in the community. You know, we, we're believers here, we believe in the word of God, we're trying to live our lives according to his word. Uh, we, we want to serve him with our hearts. He said, well, I, I believe, I believe. <laughs> I threw him out. So he, it, it was, he wasn't quite believing with his heart. He just wanted it for his, his own ends. So... Let me just give you a couple of things to warn you about keeping your heart. And I'm not going to ask you, uh, some of you, I don't even know if you've actually gone that way to give the Lord your heart. I don't know if you've done that ever, because this is what's more important than anything else. That you give him your heart, your life, your everything, because he knows he knows how best to guide us and lead us. He knows how to bring his sheep back home. He knows. He knows all about you, and he will help you. He will bring you on. He will bless you. If you are a younger, an older lady, and see a handsome man, keep your heart. If you're a younger, older man, and see a beautiful lady, keep your heart. If you're promoted at work, Keep your heart. If it doesn't happen, keep your heart. If you're successful, keep your heart. If you're unsuccessful, keep your heart. If you have money, keep your heart. If you're broke, keep your heart. If the wicked seem to prosper, keep your heart. If you have the possibility of revenge, keep your heart. Or you're powerless, keep your heart. You're criticized or praised, well-fed, or hungry, keep your heart. If you think church is boring, keep your heart. If you're used by God, keep your heart. Keep your heart for the Lord. The Lord looks on the heart. First Samuel 16, 7, an Old Testament. The Lord looks upon your heart. He wants your heart. But how, do you, how are we going to do all this? I, I, I love this verse. The Lord hit me with it. I was walking through the streets of Brussels one day. It just hit me, and to my embarrassment, I had to go and look in a concordance to find out where it is. wouldn't happen now. wouldn't happen now. It's what Paul writes in Romans 5.5. 5. For the love of God, in the old version, is shed abroad, okay? If you find the King James difficult, just think the love of God, that God has given us a shed load of his love in our hearts. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. I prefer the active rather than the passive tense. Whom he has given us. God has given us all that we may love him, love one another, walk 
in integrity before him, in integrity of heart. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. And you know, what is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with? You shall love the Lord your God with? With all your mind, your, all your soul. You shall love. God is, that commandment is there today. Jesus, they asked Jesus, what is from Matthew 23, 37? They asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And God has done everything to facilitate that love in us for himself. He's revealed himself to you. He's loved you. He's brought you from afar. I have loved you, says the Lord. He's brought you through trials, temptations, good times, bad times. I have loved you. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. You can understand the... The thing in uh, Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew, renew the spirit that you've put in, renew the steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Praise be the Lord. And that same psalm is a couple of psalms later. Would you come, please? The psalmist, a couple of psalms later, he wrote, My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. And I want you to be able to say that with me, with everyone. My heart is fixed. I, by the grace of God, I will always love the Lord. I, by the grace of God, I will always serve him. By the grace of God, there is no other one there is no other being whom I will love as I love the Lord. The Lord wants your heart. We're going to sing together, Lord, I give you my heart. And I want to ask you to, to please stand up. I, I, I'd like to call out, I'd like to call you out, but I think a communal response in a song that you can sing to the Lord. You know that... If we could get that up on the words, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every step I take, every moment I'm awake. You, my heart, I give you my soul. I live. Alone, every step that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. This is my. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake.
isn't it amazing that knowing exactly how our hearts are, that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked, that God loves us anyway. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing not to respond to that love, not to respond to the beauty of that love. The Lord's calling you. And these, see, these since last year, this time August, I've talked about calling. And there's a calling on you. There's a calling on the church. But it's not a calling that's going to be carried out half-heartedly. It's a calling on your life. It's a calling on the depths of your soul. It's a calling to you, to your heart, to serve and live for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's sing this song again. But don't sing it as a song. Sing it as a prayer to God. Sing it as a worship and prayer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My heart, give you my soul. I live for So I live for you alone. To you, the moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Father in heaven, you, you see us here before you as a community, as individuals, Lord. We thank you that there are no secrets from you. Lord, we can't keep up appearances with you, Lord. Lord, we pray. We pray you forgive us where we've, we've tried to, to look good, Lord, and we've not, simply not made the mark. We're simply nowhere near good. We simply haven't got it together. And Father, forgive us, we pray. Forgive us where our hearts have wandered, wandered to other things, Lord, whether it's our own, our own self-aggrandizement, our own self-worth, whatever. It's the self building up ourselves, Lord. Lord, if we give it all to you, Lord. Give it all to you, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would work a change in our hearts in this community today, Lord. Whether we've been with you 10 weeks, 10 years, or 100 years, Lord, Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you continue to transform our hearts, Lord. Lord, if there's any hardness there, if there's any hardness there that we don't even see or notice, if there's any hardness there, Lord, Lord, we pray you'll break that hardness, Lord. Father, for your word clearly says a broken and contrite heart you will not despise, Lord. Father, and we humble ourselves as beings, as human beings, but as a church, Lord, before you, Lord. We pray, Father. We pray, Father for that change of heart, the forgiveness of sins, the restoration, the transformation, the blessing, the blessing of the Savior, the blessing of the Savior, the renewed blessing of the Savior in our lives, Lord. Lord, we bless you and we thank you. Hallelujah. In the precious name of Jesus. Hallelujah.